Welcome to another episode of the VG Clinic. I'm one of your hosts. <laughs> you know what just how I, I always kind of question myself about that? Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Vanessa. And with me, as always, is my other host, Darren. Uh, say hello, Darren. Hello. Uh, yes, I am. I feel like I'm a bit more confident that i'm supposed to be here th <laughs> th th than you are but that's you know uh i don't know maybe it's maybe it's the caffeine you're not a big fan of it you are pretty caffeinated you are pretty caffeinated um i took yeah. a nap with the dog this afternoon i'm good to go ah uh, there's the secret folks um well, and we have a special guest uh, this month. Um, this, uh, since it is, well, one, someone who I've wanted to have on anyway, but I <laughs> thought this was a wonderful uh, occasion to bring her on. Um, is Courtney Allen, or Courtney Jean Allen. How do you want to be introduced, <laughs> Courtney? Courtney, court is fine. Yeah. Okay. Court. Um, we actually work together, but um, yes, um, I thought that it's a be a court be a wonderful fit um, since it is Black History Month and it's women in horror and uh, yeah, this is I've been wanting to talk about this an amazing movie. That we're talking about today, uh, Candyman, the 2021 version, uh, the Nia DaCosta version, and uh, Jordan Peele produced. Uh, they both co wrote it. And um, yeah, I just thought this would be a great opportunity. Uh, Courtney, we, we work together and we are on a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And there's the, there's a, a media book um, in film club and that, that I kind of do with that. And court has been very involved and we always have such amazing discussions there. And that's why I knew we, that she had to be on here. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, when I first saw this film, I had a lot to say and no one wanted to hear it. So <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we get to kind of discuss uh, the, the movie. Um, but then also, not only do Vanessa and I work together, we are fellow bookworms and um, lovers of horror. So um, yeah, I think this was a, the just perfect fit at the perfect time. So right. thanks for having me on. Yes, yes, yes. Um, wow, I, I mean, it's, and I think I mentioned to both of you <laughs> before we started recording, I just said it briefly. I, 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 some, I, I did what I tend to do sometimes. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole mm -hmm. and <laughs> I rewatched all of the Candyman movies. One, two, and three, although three is not particularly good. So I kind of actually was falling asleep during it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's just I so bad. I fell asleep during the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre the other night. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and then I reread 
Clive Barker's The Forbidden, the short story that Candyman was originally based on. And on top of that, I found this story Mm -hmm. that actually inspired um, Candyman and as we know it today. Because, you know, the Clive Barker short story, The Forbidden, is takes place in England, and it's about class. Mm-hmm. And you still get tinges of that in all, you know, I, I think in all the Candyman movies. But, you know, the, the race is, the, is m- more front and center. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> I I found um, that the, the the classism in this version was so loud, uh, well, and and just really evident. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting. I don't want to cut you off when you finish that thought, mm-hmm. but it was really interesting how the conversation around gentrification was restricted to this uh, higher class, right? And and that felt really uncomfortable. Um, that was probably one of the most comfortable aspects of the film for, for me, right? Watching it, um, and I think I've watched it maybe three or four times, but um, <clears throat> it's such a nuanced conversation. I think it's such a, uh, it requires sensitivities that were and were not present at different moments throughout the film. Um, yeah, so it's it's really interesting that, that that was your observation and your experience with this version in particular. Well, I but no, I do agree with you that in this version, uh-huh. and I do think that comes from having more of a black lens. Like, I, I mean, from behind the camera (laughs) yeah it was definitely intentional um and also creating more of a black protagonist i I, it it definitely opens up and i and i do it, it definitely yes it is these it is the elitist white people people who seem to feel like they know the best on about gentrification Mm -hmm. although you could say that no i mean the the original isn't that aware of that although they allude mildly but not so much yeah i'll keep it real with you both right so when when the original came out i was in elementary school. I grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in the projects in Brooklyn and um, Sumner Houses. And on that block, or actually Sumner, Sumner Houses is a series of blocks and it runs into another housing project into another one, right? Um, so on the, the, the block that I lived, there was a school that we all attended. Everyone in these three communities of projects attended the same elementary school. And there was a lower level where <clears throat> After school, you know, if, if there was an event um, and your mom was in, involved in the PTA, you kind of got to explore the scary lower level and play Bloody Mary, which no one ever fully played because it was too scary. So when um, when Candyman came out, I think it was in the early 90s, right? <clears throat> that was such a familiar story to us, mm-hmm. uh, seeing the projects, seeing <clears throat> um you know, having this saying a name so many times and then this monster comes out to get you, it just all felt so real. And I think that's why it was so scary for me when I first watched it. Um, and then rewatching the, the latest version and the commentary on gentrification, I, I, I don't know. It was, it was just, it felt like there was something lacking in that discussion. I thought it was important, but there were still moments where <clears throat> I was like, wow, did that just happen? Let me rewind that. Did I hear that right? 
uh, specifically well, with with the the brother and his his boyfriend's relationship. I was like, who wrote this? This is weird. Like there are things that are being said. The way he's he's calling out um, these black affluent people, um, and it was kind of going unchecked. It was weird, right? And well, um, yeah, it, and it should be said that the I I don't I, I believe. There were, I mean, there were a number of writers uh -huh. who worked on this. Right, right. Including a white man. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, Jordan Peele and Nia DaCosta, Nia da, oh yeah, DaCosta, I mean, both worked on the, the screenplay. Uh, but still, you're taking... Although the original Clive Barker story mm -hmm. had already been kind of turned into something else by Bernard Rose for the 92 movie, just by moving it to not just the United States, but Chicago and the Cabrini Green project. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And one thing you you were talking about being like being like Bloody Mary, one yeah. of those things being presence in your mind. Right. When came at, you know, you know, growing up when this came out, when the original came out, and that is one of the things that they pulled into the whole. Candyman story, uh -huh. but then there's also this true crime case. Yes, mm -hmm. that took place in a Chicago housing project uh -huh. near Cabrini Green uh -huh. in April of 1987. Ruth McCoy, who suffered from who was known to suffer from some mental illness, um, but was in the process, supposed to be supposedly in the process of uh, trying to recover and, and move out into better housing and uh, a better su support system. And she called the cops saying there was an intruder and they were coming through the mirror and it was a housing project with a mirror that could be pushed through and these killers came through and and the cops were a car like a, a squad car came by but they you know they didn't really do anything about it and then I, I mean it was it was just if it hadn't been for the persistence of neighbors community like, yeah community they I mean she ended up being found dead in her apartment two days later I, I mean it's just tragic but it was also the it's the unfortunate fortunate what we come to see typical lack of response by law enforcement right it's so it's 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 a lack emergency of services right it's a, a lack of response it's a lack of urgency it's a lack of care and priority right so they showed up but that was the extent of it they showed up and walked away and, and you know that was a very difficult article to read um considering some recent events um, over the past many years where you have had Black people who have been shot and killed in their homes by police officers, right? Where you have this woman who actually called the police for help and her body ended up lying there in a pool of blood for days. So that's just heartbreaking and horrifying and enraging. I know. And, and then... It does at least make me glad that 
in the original Candyman movie, Mm -hmm. they reference uh, someone as Ruthie Jean that Mm -hmm. disappeared, that that was taken away by Candyman, supposedly, and they came in through the mirror. Right. Of the, like, and so there's that, but there's also between that first movie and then then this most recent one you have the mother Anne Marie McCoy with mm-hmm. the last name mm-hmm. i mean so so between you know between those two and you have you do have the remembrance mm-hmm. and an, an homage to this woman that was she shouldn't just be a statistic you know she was a person who who met an unfortunate end and right and it's a cold case which right yeah which is another part of it but um yeah i was thinking about the impact of mental illness um in the black community but specifically the um the more underserved portions of the black community. Um, And I was thinking about that watching William's character. And um, you you know, you, you, you just, you see it. Mm -hmm. uh, And, and sometimes it ends up in, uh, it's just tragic and people lose their lives. Um, And I, I, I thought that that was just significant to have that character in there. Um, because he just reflected, I think, what many people have experienced around them, right, with someone in their lives um, suffering from from mental illness and, and obsessions and, and schizophrenia or whatever whatever other conditions. Um, and there's so many, quite honestly. And then, uh, but yeah, I just thought that was really. Um, I like that. That was included in the in the the story. Um, of course, he wasn't a, a character that you really sympathized with, but um, I could see that something was going on with him, and I did sympathize with that. Um, can I just really? I want to change directions really quickly and and fast forward to well, start at the beginning of the film and then fast forward to the end of the film because I was so intrigued and in love with the paper puppets and like the the kind of like silhouette cutout art i have a whole <laughs> discussion on that <laughs> i was like this is the movie this out that was haunting and it wasn't we didn't get very much of it but it was haunting and beautiful and chilling and I wanted more of that. And as the, the movie continued, I just kept going, my mind kept going back to that. And I was like, this should have been the movie. So maybe it'll be another movie. Um, but it was just beautiful. It was beautiful storytelling. And um, well, they, the um, actually used in a kind of an outside company to work with them for those segments mm-hmm. and um what well first thing when i saw them in the theater when i saw this movie in the theater the first thing that just immediately screamed out to me was kara art kara walker artwork mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. and courtney <laughs> how much i love kara walker <laughs> oh I made everybody at work listen, <laughs> read about that. Um, uh, yeah, I. so the, just this amazing artist, this, this amazing Black artist who addresses issues of race, mm-hmm. gender, and uh, sexuality, and... Uh, it just she uses these amazing kind of silhouette and like 
mostly in black and white, but yeah. a lot of just very simple monochromatic kind of tones. And it reminded me a lot of this. And Jordan Peele, which I knew before, but um, I found out with this, like, he's a huge fan of puppetry. Oh. And he was actually working to get a degree in that at Sarah Lawrence College. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that's in part, that's, that's, those segments are largely influenced by uh, Jordan Peele. They were beautiful. Yeah. And I, I think they work as a perfect way to do the flashbacks um i wanted the flashbacks as the story and i think that was <laughs> i know i wanted the I, I wanted some <laughs> flashback too but on the other hand it's kind of like the, i i felt yeah you needed to make this something unique and i think this also i think these also i think i think the use of the the shadow puppets goes along with the use of artwork throughout the rest of the film yeah yeah which oh i i yes the the film the, the artwork is all amazing and it's all they all it's all chicago artists that they found and i thought it was uh interesting i not to enter i really just want to sit here and listen to you two talk but <laughs> please you can speak up you're allowed oh, thank you um I, I won't do it much but <laughs> i i like that they got a different artist to do anthony anthony's early stuff mm -hmm. and then uh then they switched it up i i thought that was pretty cool yes and especially the way that they did i don't know i'm a big fan of clive barker's painting also and as I, am i i i love the way they uh, that sort of textural mm -hmm. oil paint i mean i've seen him scratching on canvases with knives and stuff to just mm. get it and i did see one uh, little featurette with the artists that worked on the things for the movie and just hearing them talk about how they worked on doing those things and how the they had somebody do a curation of a more chicago you know they they really went for you you could tell that chicago people were involved in this mm -hmm. you can tell that it was based in that reality there. And I, I don't know if it's a lot easier for me to go to Chicago than either of you, because it's, you know, uh, 45 minutes in the plane or, you know, six and a half hours in the car or a few in the, on the train. But, you know, just, there's just, I mean, I've been to that neighborhood before and uh, you know, when you're on the train, you're always hearing about State and Lake. I feel like every time I think somebody was riding the train, you heard the, the guy talking about State and Lake. And um, the, the Chicago neighborhoods, for my limited, I mean, I've been going back and forth there for maybe the last 15 years or so more regularly. But all the neighborhoods are really good at keeping track of their history and trying to tell stories about the neighborhood that kind of get glossed over a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I, one thing I will say, and when in court, you were, you partially pointed towards this as an issue of class and it is, but it, it is also just a complete criticism of the art world. Oh yeah, absolutely. So what? Yeah. I have worked is very in the art world and oh my goodness, mm -hmm. there were so many things in here that 
I, I was just like, it's not even just like, oh, ha, 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 you, they've made up that character in a movie or something. It's like, no, there are certain people that exact kinds of thing. And like with the one art critic who comes out with saying something like, well, when your kind moves into a neighborhood and, and Anthony's like, excuse me? And she's like, well, artists, like daring her to say, don't, do you mean black people or people? But not, but not just that, that's also, um, and she's bordering on, it's bordering on, you know, obviously on the racism too. Of, of but, course. But then that's but, also, you know, what was very interesting just before you get off of that topic, which was very interesting to me about that statement was, hey, there are, uh, black people in the hood who are amazing artists right, right. and these neighborhoods are gentrified you know just suggesting that the, the 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 talent and the skill does not exist within um you know poor neighborhoods oh right <laughs> it, it's it's just unbelievable to me that this that yeah that that attitude of how could you possibly have any talent or anything to say and uh, she doesn't want to there there's there's a certain invisibility until there's a tragedy i i mean i thought she was really arrogant and just straightforward oh, her oh yeah Oh, she's and absolutely like she, arrogant. As a critic, she felt like the art world had ownership over telling the stories of oppression and violence that are experienced within these communities, right? Um, and that's always, that, that's such an interesting narrative that you see happen. You see it playing out in movies. You see it playing out in music. You see it playing out in television, um, that people have ownership over those stories. And oftentimes those, oftentimes those people have not lived those realities, right, that they're portraying. Um, very interesting. I, I wanted to, <laughs> speaking of the art critic, her scene, the scene where she is killed was probably my, this is going to sound really horrible, but that was my favorite uh, murder scene in <laughs> the film because I was like, what is, what, did, what am I looking at? I was having a conversation with my mom and she's like, oh wow, she's being killed. And I'm like, wait, rewind that. I, I, what's uh -huh. what and so I almost missed it, and I love that. Um, there, was, yeah, that was a pretty awesome scene. Well, that it, and I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> it sounds gruesome, but <laughs> it's if you're not paying attention, you miss you miss it. Mm -hmm. Um, as usual, I mean, it, it's just anything where I think that that comes from a Jordan Peele production. Yes. Even if he's not directing, mm -hmm. he's always working with people who have these, uh, putting these little Easter eggs or mm -hmm. attention to detail that if you, yeah, again, like there's one scene in here where it's the little, it's a Berg mm -hmm. when he's having the flashback to being a child mm -hmm. and he's going to like, turning on the light at the laundry room and he's like by the wall and he's starting to walk out and you see a sign on the wall partly in focus it has a like a cartoon b on it mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter another b and a b actually starts to appear and then the candy and then we have an entrance of Candyman. It's very interesting, like little subtle things like that. Uh, you know, I, um, I uh, who it is that's reading a Clive Barker book in some scene. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. What was uh, interesting, and I was asking some friends who had also watched the film just to see if it was very obvious to them, because it was obvious to me. And I was like, wow, this is like, they're being really in your face with this. So we know that it tends to be a cliche in horror films that Black people 
will die first, right? So right. it's like kind of a joke um, when it was a joke, it, it's not so much anymore, but a joke when a black person got to survive an entire horror movie. Um, and in this, I was like, it, it was just very interesting that Candyman only killed white people. Um, there was this scene and I was like, why is this character even in the movie, right? The, the young high school teenager who was in the art gallery with her mom. Um, but she was in there for a very specific reason, right? When you saw her mom, you could tell that she was dressing in a very particular way um, that would, could be considered appropriating black culture. And so when she's in school and she's in the bathroom, that mm -hmm. scene, so, it felt so, everything about that scene felt so deliberate. So it's the friends and there was an Asian friend on the end and then the young yes. girl in the stall and they start calling out to Candyman and the Asian friend says, I'm out. She takes right. it and the black girl just stays locked up in the, the stall. Um, the geeky black girl with the bad brains mm -hmm. um, patch mm -hmm. on the bag. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. like, you're cool. I want to hang with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, wow. It was, uh, that was pretty obvious. And I, I, I can't remember, and I should, because I just rewatched it this week. Um, but I might've stepped away because I, I can never remember um, if it was Candyman who killed William or the cops. Um, I can't remember. William? Oh, no, that was uh, Brianna. Okay, okay. So Candyman. Well, Brianna, she, she stabs him so many times, like in the eye. <laughs> Why did I not remember? I don't remember that. Because um, he's trying to kill her. Yeah, he's trying to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they've moved back into, um, they've moved out of the church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they were like in an abandoned housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I remember him getting killed, but I don't remember her stabbing his eyes out. <laughs> watch this. <laughs> How did I not like remember that moment after watching the, the movie multiple times? So I got to go back to that. But yeah, I just found that to be a very interesting choice. And it, it felt like Jordan Peele, like he was all over that. Yeah. I was just curious if it was as obvious to other people as it as it was uh, to me when I watched it. Have you seen the alternate ending? I have not. Yes, I have. I have Maybe not. Then I will not spoil it. Okay. But there is an alternate ending, which I think is an, an interesting way to take it. Mm. Mm. But I do like the actor like the way this way better mm, mm. yeah what was released i'll have to i'll have to find that ultimate ending yeah and let you know what i think about that um yeah yeah it's it, it's it's a it's a lot but uh, but yeah i mean it, it's funny you're right the kills are all like disposable white people it's kind of it's pretty funny it, actually it's a pretty funny commentary on the horror and like the horror genre in hollywood right like because for so long yes it was oh it's the black person dies for the most part and then it started becoming the asian person dies mm -hmm. yeah and i think we're still kind of stuck a little with with that a little bit with hollywood unfortunately um i think we're yeah we, we we're probably still stuck i probably i'm, I'm saying i'm talking mainstream that. hollywood i'm talking yeah, mainstream. I, I don't even i'm not a fan of mainstream hollywood film or television so um i feel like we were making progress and maybe I just assumed that that progress continued. Um, yeah, it, it, in the, the horror genre specifically, I'll say, um, where you would see people of color uh, surviving um, and they weren't just cast to be the first or second ones killed. 
Yeah. Well, right. I mean, it's, it, it is pretty, well, for instance, I, I mean, one thing I, I will say is in here, not only you do have uh, the gay couple, but they're an interracial gay couple and they survive till the end. And that's a far cry from the interracial gay couple that we see in Blackula. Right. Who, that was, actually, that was very surprising to even see a gay, hip, gay couple on screen. But the fact that they were interracial was even more shocking. And then, um, they were, but they were also in a healthy relationship. So Brianna comments, I'm, I'm so glad he, he's found, you know, like a good one or a normal one, right? And a lot of times we see uh, gay couples portrayed as more dysfunctional and um, they, they were her people, right? When, when her, um, when Anthony starts bugging out, they were her people that she went to. And um, so, yeah, I thought that was a, um, I, I thought that was important to show that, that yeah. he had a good, stable support system. I agree. But I, you know what? I got to go back to keeping it real. There were elements in that relationship that I was just like, what is going on? I know. But the first yeah. time they met when they're, they're at Brianna's home and uh, the boyfriend is sitting on her dining room table with his feet in her the bench of her table set i was like there's no that i was what's going on <laughs> i know well okay yeah, because i thought that they were meeting for the first time i was like that's awfully comfortable i don't I mean, care who you are right i don't care if it was the first or hundredth time I, people don't do that i have never i was just that's why i was like who, who wrote this um <laughs> yeah i know that's i know there were like there were some weird yeah, weird yeah. Like that was that. interesting but it was just little moments like that um that that would take me out of the reality of things from time to time but um yeah i thought it was just it was important to to have that sort of um positive representation in the film along with seeing you know powerful uh, accomplished black artists and black people in the art industry um yeah i thought i just thought that was uh those were little details that i i could definitely appreciate in the story i can't even say little details they were important details obviously because they they stood out and they had an impact yeah yeah can i say it was just nice to see uh vanessa williams and uh even though it was a very short scene um to have her in this up-to-date version of the movie. Um, I just say that because I, it's just always good to see her on film. Oh. You get enough credit and enough. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I, I mean, she was reprising the same character. So mm -hmm. that was, I thought that was wonderful. Yeah. But this movie came out right around the time that she was doing a story arc on the L word generation Q where she was playing an art a radical artist and lover of lover to Bette Porter played by Jennifer Beals. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh it, you know, and that was great to see her in that too, because she, you know, was totally different. Yeah. side than this or uh some other you know other things i've seen her in but yeah she you're right it's it's great to see her just pop up in things yeah and you know uh, i noticed that she added like her middle name to her stage name um probably just to kind of differentiate herself between the other vanessa williams um, and i'm sure they've gotten very different opportunities throughout their careers because of what they look like. Both beautiful women, um, but they look very different from each other. And um, I was like, oh man, after all these years, she had to kind of tweak her name a little bit, but yeah, it was just good to see her. Yeah. Well, and I wonder, I you know, and I wonder, cause she's been doing, 
she's been on on Days of Our Lives for a while. Is that still on television? Yeah. Yes, it is. No, but I was looking on her IMDb. Yeah, don't touch me. <laughs> I, I've been looking. I was looking on her IMDb credits, and it looks like she's been on there for like regularly. Oh, okay. for like three or four years. Good for her. And for daytime soap, mm -hmm. that adds up. Oh yeah. Oh so, yeah. Maybe they were. I, I don't know. Maybe it was when around that time. Like, I don't know her agent or she was getting pressure Probably. to Probably. She, yeah it was it was really it was pretty recent that that happened name change right yeah i'm gonna call out a little nuance that i noticed in the the storytelling as well i don't know if either of you noticed it but as a black woman i always appreciate a small detail when there is a black woman in a, a film or a, a series and she's getting ready for bed and she wraps her hair. So the fact that uh, Tiana Taylor's character yes. Tiana had on a scarf, um, I really did appreciate that that nuance. Um, and I, I, I think we can give credit to the director for that. But Tiana Taylor, actually, um, I'm sorry, I'm calling her the wrong name. That is not Tiana Taylor. Um, what is her last name? Paris. Paris. There we go. Goodness gracious. Two different, two different industries. Um, she tends to show up in films and television in bed scenes with a bonnet or a headscarf. So I don't know if it was her doing or the director's doing. Uh, either way, I loved it. And I just think it's always important to have that little glimpse of reality, right? Um, when you're, when you're telling specific stories of specific individuals so yeah i just want to call that out i don't know if y'all noticed it i did and i was no, like okay. no i mm -hmm. absolutely noticed it i i i was i actually i was glad i'm glad you pointed that out because i, I you know it, it wasn't just that it was also if you she just also didn't look like she still had makeup on and was going to bed with that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a like you would normally do before you go to bed, right? You would wash your face and take it. it it's so unrealistic about most movies. It's like, oh, somebody also wakes up and they're perfectly, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I know. I saw that, and I, I, I just always like that's. I mean, that's yeah. That was a nice touch yeah um oh and i wanted <laughs> we were talking about people in the cast i wanted to go to uh coleman domingo who played um william burke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah he's, he's one of those people who pops up it like in a bunch of different things but i i was looking at some things that he's been in and one of the things was the big gay sketch show Oh, oh, I don't know if either of you saw that show. No. Um, this is this is how I this is how I know Kate McKinnon. That was what she was on before she was on SNL. Mm. Yeah, that show. Uh, I mean, it's like fifteen whatever years ago that it was on, but or so. And um, if I'm I'm trying to remember specifically like what kind of characters he played on there i mean sadly they did not have many people of color in their cast um but i think he may have been the one who played they would do these segments where it would be um lost connections the the man-to-man -man section of lost connections of craigslist Mm -hmm. as read by Maya Angelou <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> it was it was hysterical because he had the perfect impersonation of Maya Angelou and but it was reading the most like <laughs> it'll be like <laughs> just <laughs> grinder type wanting to hook up things it, yeah it was just, 
Yeah, that's the, I mean, I know he's been in plenty of other things, but that's like, when I read that, I was like, oh, yes, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, he's been in so much and he's just super talented. But I just, I, but I, cause I think, I, I guess I tend to think of him more in dramatic roles. Uh -huh. But I was like, oh, I totally forgot about that comedic, <laughs> like, turn. Yeah, I have to find that because I, I don't think I've, I might have seen him do some comedy, but I, I can't recall it. So, yeah, if you can find a link to where I can check that out. Yeah, I ha I'll have to, I'll have to find it. If it's, if it's what I'm thinking of, I mean, uh, but, um, anyway, yeah, and I mean, this, it, 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 I think that, well, so these, you know, these kind of, the whole gist behind this movie to some extent and to tie it in a way back to the original is that these urban legends mm -hmm. are a way to keep the community to warn the community to, and to keep them safe from the real horrors in the world mm -hmm. and you know and and I think that I, I mean I think that makes a lot of sense. I I re I also rewatched the documentary, um, that was released on Shutter, uh, Horror Noir, and one line uh, that struck me was, "Black history is black horror," mm. and that you know, y and you can trace in a way just look at like the representation in Birth of a Nation. That's a representation of black horror. I mean it's it's totally but it's weird. not but it's but it's you know a distorted lens um yeah yeah it is because mm -hmm. look who was telling it i mean this is true um, this is true but if you just if you even look at the story that they're telling through the the, the paper pu puppets and the the silhouettes uh, yeah. that is so reminiscent of emmett till right and, well, right um and the fact that you can take that story that, you know, gosh, it's actually came up in one of our um, our calls, right? How the story of Emmett Till is a story that just about every black person knows from the time that you are um, young through your entire mm -hmm. adult life. That story is passed down from generation to generation. And um, it is a story of, of fear for sure. And you can take something like that and inject it into a horror film and it makes perfect sense. Um, so at, I know at the end, the very end of the movie, there's voiceover asking Candyman, um, who are you or something like that. And he starts going into, you know, I'm the writing on the wall. And I know that the idea was for him to, or, or this um, entity to represent vengeance and justice and legacy this legacy of, of violence right all wrapped up into one and then to use all of that to to protect the community um i think i wanted more of that and you got that protection at the very end when he saved brianna but i wanted to feel more of that throughout the film and um yeah i don't i don't know I, I, that felt like something that was lacking for me when I walked away. I felt half full. I felt half full and I wanted to be, you know, overflowing with that, especially because these stories, um, you know, the, the legend of Candyman is so rooted in that black pain and that black trauma um, throughout the years. And it takes us to modern day, what's happening with gentrification. And I still felt like there was there was this um, there was something about that support system that Candyman was supposed to represent that didn't feel all that supportive. And I don't know what could have changed that in the story for me exactly, but I'm sure there are a couple of things that that could have potentially happened. Um, and who knows? Maybe that is a segue to another movie. I, we don't know what they might have planned um yeah I, yeah i think there's a lot of room for them to keep exploring the ideas that they 
seem to start presenting to us closer to the yeah. end of the film, you know, what they built to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are more than uh, capable. Mm -hmm. I mean, this movie's rad. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, uh, if they stay with similar crew, or I mean, mm -hmm. Nina Costa, she's still on her way up. Yeah. She, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. That, which, by the way, can props to where they're due. Um. Isn't Nia da Costa the first female, mm -hmm. not just black female, but the first female to have? Um, it was a debut, was it? Like, yeah. What was it? What was the debut like with the the box office intake? She was like, it broke all these records, and I mean, like, it was very significant. Um, it was sorry. I should be more prepared, but the the one is... I had seen was a uh, first black female filmmaker to have a film open at number one in the box office. So. Well, there's that, but it was yeah. I thought there wasn't there was something else where yeah yeah I, I just saw that one um, as the first black female director to open with a film debut number one yeah i mean it's still i mean that's I mean, pretty amazing I, it's just to have any you know it, the it's not a typical film mm -hmm. even though yes it's it's not you can't even say it's a sequel per se it, because it couldn't it could stand in a way as its own as its own film even if someone hadn't seen the others hadn't read it, you know short story didn't know anything about it they i think they could watch this on its own and have their own ideas yeah it feels like a remake in its true sense right and and so we we see that happening a lot i think with black kids, movies and tv where um it's not necessarily a, a sequel or a, a prequel but they're just recreating the story and they're kind of recreating the characters a bit even though the story is still familiar. Um, it stands on its own completely, and I, I think she accomplished um, just that with 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 this version. Um, and there were just some gorgeous shots throughout the film. Oh, yeah, the cinematography. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. There was there was one shot that I had to just pause on it. He was um, Anthony's character was standing in the middle of. That, that the old housing complex. And so of course everything is run down and what's around him looks so dark, but then ahead of him are these huge, shiny, bright buildings. And it was just such a statement. It was not just gorgeous, but it said so much. Um, yeah, that was just gentrification. If you needed a photo to put in the, the dictionary or encyclopedia next to a definition of, of that concept, um, that would fit beautifully. One thing yeah, that and speaking, I you know, speaking of the artists going into the neighborhoods, the first time I went to that area was on mm -hmm. my way to play a show at a, a recording studio slash punk club that was, you know, being operated at very low, low cost. Mm -hmm. um, it was because, yeah, it was a, cl a little closer to Goose Island. Eventually, I don't know if either of you are familiar with the area. No, I've, I've been to Chicago a couple of times, but it was always downtown Chicago. So, okay. yeah, familiar. Yeah. It's shown around. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'd all, uh, since it's not too far from here, uh, we would often end uh, West Coast tours on our way back. We would have, you know, a weekend show in Chicago and then hang out with friends or whatever and then make our way back home and then eventually you just get over yeah so i i was going up for a while to visit a lady friend so i was there more frequently and uh yeah so i got to see the chocolate factory where jeffrey dahmer worked when he was oh my gosh. living in the area and oh <laughs> all these cool little bars and neighborhoods and you know she worked at wrigley field so you know went to a cubs game 
nice. and then went to all that other stuff. And then, yeah, I was like, you know, we loved horror movies. So she's like, I'm going to show you, you know, it's not the same, but we're going to go to where Candyman's from. Mm. But anyway, sorry to interject. Oh, right, no, we get started. Not at all. I know. I mean, I, I have lived in one of those like office uh, those artist loft spaces before that basically was a burnt out building mm. that they just basically barely <laughs> refinished <laughs> so people could kind of live in it <laughs> mm. you know um but it was, you know, in an area, well, that is now more, I would say, since I left the area, it's definitely, I would say, more gentrified in Bushwick <laughs> than when I lived there in Brooklyn. But um, anyway. It's everywhere in Brooklyn, right? <laughs> yeah. I like it. I, yeah. I know there are, there there are a lot of different issues surrounding it, and I I feel that and I think you did say this earlier, Courtney, that it, it, there could have been more of a conversation about that, perhaps. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and you know, in, in I a more meaningful way, like right. rather than just from I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think not having the conversation at all might have for me as a as a uh, a black woman viewing black woman from the projects that has experienced gentrification um at its core and just like the violence of it um i feel like if you weren't going to really have the conversation um maybe you should have backed off a little bit um right that's, yeah because it was such a perfect, it was it was the perfect opportunity. This film was the perfect opportunity to really um, say some, have some tough commentary there, right? And exchanges. And um, again, because so much of it was coming from a specific class level, it just did not feel meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you're right. You're right. Definitely. It's, it, it, it was... It was still a limited view. What I, I wonder if part, I, I don't know if it was completely done on purpose, but I almost wonder if, you know, the, the, the art critic and the gallery guy and the more financially secure folk clumsily talking about the issue as if they are, feel like they are authorities on it i don't know if if any of that was on purpose it seemed like that was definitely on purpose right so yeah that part um i got it it was the conversations that brianna and anthony was having um with her her brother and uh, troy is the brother's name right and i can't remember the boyfriend's name grady that's true yeah, so those conversations where they're all like sitting up in this fancy apartment and then the boyfriend is like, oh, kind of like, you know, as they're critiquing gentrification, the boyfriend steps in and he's like, well, that's pretty much what y'all have done. Y'all come into this area that used to house poor people and now it's all built up and here you are with your money um, and your class status. So... You know, there, there were just, I, I felt like there could have been opportunities to have different perspectives in that conversation, especially when you're talking about gentrification and you're diving into this, this old project grounds and, and, um, and talking, you know, introducing characters that were raised there and still living there. I, I just felt like there was missed opportunity um, in that. Who knows? It could have been in the script and that edited out. Who knows? Well, true, because I mean, I, I, I did watch 
deleted scenes, but there's nothing that would that expands um, on that. And for a movie that's about an hour and a half, I feel like you you could there's room to add a little to the script there mm-hmm. yeah. uh doesn't have to be a big massive long amount of time but you're allowed for time to have a little bit more in-depth discussion and still mm-hmm. keep this movie at a tight pace right right um because you also look you have already are addressing issues mm-hmm. of mental illness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and police yeah. brutality mm-hmm. and 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 then just general microaggressions and in, in other ways that you know particularly the mental illness mm-hmm. and the police brutality and and just wanting to be you know represented and this you know seen um it's just there's already so much there it wouldn't take that much more time or effort to add in the just a couple extra minutes (laughs) in the script yeah Yeah. and I, i wondered if anthony was meant to be that representation um, and that voice and that perspective, but um, I didn't sense that he was. I just had to ask myself that question because it was, it was, you know, you mentioned all of the elements that were tackled, but all of these other elements that were tackled, that could be, you know, their own movie in itself, uh, but they still managed it into the story. Hey, that's not Brooklyn this time. <laughs> not right, but that's my Brooklyn energy, like attracting that noise and that activity. Um, always Brooklyn in my heart. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I just, you know, when they were going back to the old project grounds, I felt like maybe there could have just been a character there that had some insight to offer. Um, it, it, there, there could something could have happened, right? Um, yeah, that was that was a little disappointing for me. Um, and I could just be highly sensitive because I was born and raised in the projects and I know the kind of um, ideas and judgments that people kind of latch on to that. And when I see it being portrayed in films, I, I, when it, there's something that feels, uh, not dehumanizing, but there's like this coldness about it where it's just a word. You just say gentrification or you just happen to show the buildings and you're not capturing the heart of the the people that actually live and experience that space. Um, I'm extra sensitive to that. So that could be why my disappointment was so deep. And I just, you know, I like the film. I wanted to love it, but that was one of the reasons why I just couldn't love it the way I hoped to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there was, oh man, what there was something I wanted to ask. Um, I can't remember. It'll come to mind. It has, it just escaped my brain. It'll come back. And you, you know, his mother, mm-hmm. when, you know, when Ant- Anthony goes, goes and talks to her, she she talks about i mean he asked why didn't you tell me mm-hmm. and you know because they moved away from cabrini green um and he grew up in another part of chicago and she's like i thought i could keep you safe mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and isn't and that's the same phrase that every parent wants to tell their child, mm-hmm. but it it feels like every black person I know that has said, "Oh, 
the time when I had the discussion from my parents as a child about interacting with law enforcement or interacting with certain kinds of people, uh, you know, who may be racist and, you know, that kind of thing, it, you know, and, and how it, there's always this like fear mm -hmm. that's, and, 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 and this goes back to where, where I was saying earlier that you know your urban legends are there to basically as a way to cover for everyday real life horror because nobody wants to believe that there are real life horrors in the world i mean at least not as many as there are maybe um i i absolutely hear what you're saying um i can tell you that the realities that I have witnessed, and this is just like my personal, um, my my personal point of view. But the realities that I've witnessed, the stories of other people's realities, have always been far, far scarier, far more frightening um, than any urban legend I've ever heard. The urban legends have been kind of like fun and games, right? And um, it's the real stories that became kind of what urban, they became urban legends to us, but they were real. Um, right. Yeah, like stories about, uh, that feel like ghost stories, but they weren't ghost stories, you know? Um, like, you know, just reading that article about this this woman that's suffering from mental illness and she's calling the cops and, you know, no one comes to her aid, essentially, right? They show up, but they don't show up. Stories that I've heard about, um, you know, people with mental illness in the neighborhood and um, murders and, and uh, you know, all sorts of things that are frightening. And yeah. I've... I mean, I've, I've had that happen where mm -hmm. my police, my, my neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, who had a family member that lived with them that was off their psych meds and mm -hmm. had, uh, you know, some sort of uh, mental episode and they were trying to get 911 there to help. Um, and the cops just, yeah, just killed the neighbor, killed my neighbor. Mm. And I mean, my neighbor was, yes, a person of color, uh, too, um, which I know that was an additional part of the situation, but it, they don't treat the mentally ill well in in general so and and you do even i mean you see that but well the sorry i lost my train of thought <laughs> see darren's had all the coffee you know i don't do caffeine either so i'm feeling it <laughs> oh no i cut it i just i've started cutting it off at a certain point in the day i i can't even um, if I try to drink a cup of coffee, my goodness, I could probably run a marathon. That's how sensitive my body is to, uh, to caffeine. And, and yes, real life horrors are worse. And, but we, but these, these urban legends are like, they're to some extent are created. I mean, yes, to scare kids, but you know, you also have to hit the point where to let the child know or someone know, know these are real horrors. These are real concerns that you need to be, you know, that you need to worry about. And that's why, I mean, like the, the, sorry, I have completely lost. I had, I had a thought, I, I really did have a turn. I, I really did have a point to make and no, that's fine. I'm going to just step in and mention, kind of go back to the, the, the whole thing because I, I thought 
they they continue to to kind of circle back on that uh, beautifully with various characters, right? And um, certainly William was one that stood out in my mind, but then also um, Anthony, right? I think he would be experienced by people as someone that was having some sort of a mental breakdown, a psychotic breakdown. And even just watching his his physical appearance shift Mm -hmm. felt so familiar. Um, It it reminded me of on one end, um, on a light end, it reminded me of the fly (laughs) and how that obsession, and then he just morphed into this monster. Um, But then- Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) You get the bonus. I was like, oh, it was so creepy. Like, I, yeah, I love the, that movie, but it, I, it's hard to watch that transformation. So it was very hard to watch his transformation too. But then outside of like just watching this film, I be, beyond that, I was like, oh, the, the, the transformation, the shift that occurs in people that are dealing with mental health issues and they're not being supported um, and they're not receiving any sort of treatment that can really just completely make them unrecognizable to themselves and others. And so, um, while I couldn't look at him, it was still breaking my heart at the same time. Um, yeah, every time I've rewatched the film, that's that's hard for me to to see un- unfold. Yeah, and 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 I, I, I and I said ding 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 about the fly because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nia Costa on like the extras to movie specifically say she was influenced by Cronenberg's The Fly. I mean, it's it's between yeah. the body horror mm-hmm. and this yeah, weird love story mm-hmm. obsession. Mm-hmm. Um, she said that that you know, very, that played very much into it for her. But I particularly love the makeup work Mm -hmm. that was done to create uh, the transformation Mm -hmm. from Anthony into Candyman. Mm -hmm. Because as the child of an entomologist... (laughs) Um, I particularly love that it looked like honeycomb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We had beehives in my backyard um, until I was maybe probably three, three and a half. Wow. Yeah. And we also found out I was allergic to them. <laughs> beehives? To the bees or the hives, or the no, hives. to the bee, to the oh. to to be the uh, to bee stings. Oh, like okay. I can I can have honey, like I'm fine with that, mm-hmm. or like having beeswax around, right? Uh, but it's just, yeah. At least I'm not like, oh, I have to have an epipen with me at all times. But yeah, so oh, well, I, my sister is allergic to mosquito bites and. My goodness, what happens to her poor face over the summer is just, yeah, just swells up from every little bite. But back to bees and flies, yes, I, I saw that uh, some, you know, how familiar that was. And I, I wondered if there was any sort of influence. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know that she had mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just, I, and, um, but I, I, you know, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely there aside from just the body horror mm-hmm. Aspect, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. but um darren is there anything you want to elaborate on yeah you've been no. relatively uh, quiet these are my favorite kinds of episodes where i just get to sit and listen to uh people smarter than i talk about things uh more eloquently than i would jabber out if i unleashed my my coffee into the microphone (laughs) (laughs) that was a you painted a a very um clear and hilarious picture so i wish you would have unleashed our coffee into the microphone (laughs) maybe next time (laughs) don't want to scare Um, you away it's your first time here (laughs) 
one um uh, thing I I did want to bring up is that you know when they filmed the original Candyman in Cabrini Green um there was all the gang activity and they actually had to broker a deal with some of the gangs that were uh, in the housing project and they actually hired some of them to work on the set I, I, but I love this story <laughs> I love this story and I probably um, shouldn't love it as much as I do but the idea that you're coming into people's homes hire them well if they're in a gang or not hire them well and that's just it yeah. so they did so they did love it they, they hired they hired and and they actually there were some of the surviving gang members still there in that area mm -hmm. and so they got they talked to them and and um worked with them somewhat for for the uh this 2021 version yeah i love that I, especially because how hypocritical would it be to to come into this area and, and have conversations through your art around gentrification um however satisfied or dissatisfied i am with those personally i'm with those conversations but to, to even um to bring that up in your art and not take some sort of action like reach out and and um, and work with the community so that's I'm, I'm happy to hear that that's pretty cool pretty darn cool yeah i know i i it's it's like it's one of those things like hearing that when robin williams worked on a, a, a film he always made sure that a certain percentage of the uh, of homeless people be employed wow for wow. the film mm -hmm. always so i mean yeah i and i i i don't see how they could go into an area with a without it's but, the right um, thing to do and it would really fuck with the popularity of the film as soon as everybody found out no true that you know like like you said court you said you prefer courtney or court court is fine yeah uh, like like you like you said court it'd be extremely hypocritical yeah to not have done mm -hmm. but. so thanks for sharing that story because i actually had no idea so that does ease up some of my um <laughs> some of my frustration around uh the the missed opportunities in 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 the film that you know just good to hear that there was some some sort of outreach and and um partnership with the community yeah i i, I mean i yes there's certainly not enough right of course <laughs> yeah discussion but yeah. um right um but you know and on a totally separate topic, I want to mention the music. I so I've always loved the the original Philip Glass score, mm -hmm. and you know that iconic theme, which is so. It's just like something that it's like the setting for a fairy tale, or something that you would hear on a music box. Mm -hmm. It's always made me think of this kind of, it, it, it's kind of like cues like this sense of we're retelling a tale that's been told before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like passing down, like just the general sense of oral tradition amongst the community. Right. Um, and which that's also general folklore. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, gives you how the Candyman legend evolves within the community over time. Uh, and for this new version, 
I like that. I mean, they did pull elements from the original, but then they brought in this completely different. I mean, another avant-garde composer, but this was a black one from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Or I don't think originally from Chicago, but he's lived in Chicago a long time. So I'm like, I, you know, I kind of love that, that, you know, just again, keeping it more just Chicago centric mm-hmm. mm-hmm. with your, with your crew, as, you know, and your, your, just your production time kinds of elements um as well as uh, just oh the film setting or the story setting rather but have either of you ever said candy man five times in a mirror i know i sure as hell haven't hell no hell no <laughs> not candy man not bloody mary we don't play like that around these parts Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. i'm not that stupid white person <laughs> <laughs> Because mm-hmm. every, because it's true. Every time you watch this, you're just like, oh, stupid white people doing stupid white people shit. <laughs> I, I just don't even find that kind of thing. Um, no, it's not fun. I'm not. No, no, thank you. I'm good. I don't play with it. Yep, not at all. Not at all. Wasn't there? So there was a moment um, between. Uh, What's the boyfriend's name again? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting his name. The brother's boyfriend? Yeah, the brother's boyfriend. Grady? Grady. He was he was trying to to, you know, say uh Candyman and Troy was like, no, no, uh uh-uh, uh, stop playing, stop playing around. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> he was not having it. That's me. Like, mm-mm. You wanna play those games? Yeah. I'm, I'm exiting the room, perhaps the building, the home, wherever we are. I'm not I'm not messing with not messing with that Mm-mm. yeah yeah I, I i know maybe nothing but i'm not risking it nope I've, um yeah no thank you um i'm not a scary person but i have had some strange encounters in my life and yeah as if i <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to summon any more strange encounters, that's for sure. Um, I I do just want to, you know, say, and this is probably the last thing that I have to share. I really did appreciate the way that they attempted to wrap everything up, right? With, With taking these, this idea of people who are, um, perceived as a monster or a villain um, or violent and and kind of flipping that inside out and making them into saviors for the community or heroes to the community or protectors of the community. Um, I appreciated the effort to, you know, really convey that at the end as a way to wrap things up um, because it, it just feels so realistic, right? Um, you know, thinking about, I'm going to use um, the example of the Black Panthers who were demonized and made into villains when when truly, in reality, they were doing so much to actually help the community. And and so I liked, I just liked that nice, neat tie up at the, the end. I still wanted more of the, the puppet work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get over it, obviously. It was it was haunting and chill. Like I, I literally got chills, and I was like, I could watch this for an hour. I could watch it for two hours. Just I, tell me a whole story in this in this format, and I would just I would be hooked. Yeah, I think we oh. naturally came to a conclusion of the episode. Oh, that's that's rare. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I know we usually have a problem like. <laughs> We're just babbling, babbling, and then we're like, um... Like, wait, we stopped talking about what we were talking about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so, the last thing. Would 
you recommend the movie. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Easily. Easily. Yep. Yeah. I would recommend people watch it more than once, even. Yeah, I think it I think it benefits from more than one mm -hmm. watch. Yeah. Because you do have a lot going on and and just a little you know, some little things here and there. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I almost missed the critic being lifted into midair and and smeared across her windows. I, I mean, I I blinked and almost missed that. So I think there are a lot of moments that you can miss um, on your first watch. So yep, I would recommend it at least twice, maybe even three times. I've watched it four times. Yeah, I think I've seen it four times now. Well, I guess I have to watch it one more time. Yep, come on, get get that next watch in. Mm -hmm. All right, I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know they on imdb which i don't go by their ratings at all but out of 10 stars what do you think they rated it i think i saw like five and a half i saw a really maybe that was maybe that was um 5.9 yeah yeah I was like, oh, this is harsh. And I'm like, obviously, people who missed some things or wanted something totally different. Well, and it's IMDb. There's probably. Right. A That's whole exactly bunch what I mean. They're like, I can't believe they went and put race into Candyman. Right. When it always kind uh, of was. <laughs> it already was there, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. So, you know, one yeah, star. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That you know, and, but, but this one, like the first one, I mean, shared this, this idea of someone who gets obsessed with this Candyman mm -hmm. story. And are they, you know, are, are they losing their mind? Or are they being haunted or becoming right. a candy man? I, you know, it, you said this idea that, you know, someone gets obsessed with candy man. Every time I've watched either version, I always thought it was this idea of someone getting possessed by candy. Man. Well, yeah. and it, it, but it is, but it is that mm -hmm. too. I, I think mm -hmm. that there is a point where it, takes it moves to possession right yeah it moves from obsession to possession and and it's you have lines like through all these movies that are that are things like be my victim or be my witness oh. or tell everyone i mean things okay. like that where it's just like you it's whoever candy man is speaking to the new one in the line basically um or the the or the protagonist who was there at the end you know it's basically continuing the story right well, and you know what, Anthony and Daniel Robitaille was was an artist in the original one, right? The yes. Original story, and Brianna, who's a curator of art, mm -hmm. and it's and all of, and in know, Candyman too, which is not actually a terrible sequel. It's supposed to be a long descendant of Daniel Robitaille's. Who is teaching art? And art's and all about telling self. a bigger story. Right. Yeah, and it's giving tell, background on Daniel Robitaille. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. So, yeah. No, yeah. So uh, that's just another thing I appreciated. And they purposefully made the main character an artist mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. for those tie-ins and for the 
you know, the conduit for bigger ideas. Right. And, and things like that. Of course, Tony Todd. Uh, I wish he did audiobooks or more audiobooks. <laughs> he probably does audiobooks somewhere, but. I know. Just anytime I see him in a movie and then I've met him a couple times at different horror conventions and just always wonderful to uh, hear his voice. The de-aging wasn't too bad. I think it was uh, even with with the extra Bs, which I'm sure were <laughs> digital this time. Ah, uh, well, yeah, darn. that they had to use. <laughs> darn. Real Bs. The original. Oh. Hey, I, I'm Tony Todd. I just love that he was so smart that he got it in his contract that he got a special bonus for every time he got stung by a bee. Uh -huh. And they had a special breed of bee for just for the, the like that they they kind of work with to develop for the movie. Or, well, for several movies. Yeah. Sag card carrying bees. <laughs> Bag card carrying bees. But we don't handle their pension and health. <laughs> and their wage payments. <laughs> Sorry. That's a reference <laughs> to my job. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, this has okay. been fun. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for in, inviting me and uh, kind of bearing with me through my New Jersey uh, traffic noises. Um, Vanessa, I didn't hear any Brooklyn noises on your side, so. It, it was quiet here tonight, I guess. Um, maybe because I didn't have my usual mic working. So it, what, it you didn't hear that quite as well. And you didn't he quite hear the uh, racket in my hallway <laughs> or the summertime episodes <laughs> they sit there in the winter as well well there's a lot more outside noise in the summertime i think it it's perfect for the ambiance because you where you're from helps you know inform where you're from it's true it's true they must have changed well, the traffic patterns for the helicopters. I live between <laughs> uh, two or three hospitals oh, within wow. a couple miles, so there used to always be a helicopter flying over. That's fun. Yes. Or, you know, the occasional police helicopter. But anyway, like, I, like you saw before we turned off the cameras, I am in a soundproofish room. Yeah, you got a great setup going on there. Thank you. But uh, uh, yeah, it was wonderful talking with you and uh, meeting with you and hearing your take on the movie. Hearing this is I you're the first two people I've talked with about the movie. Oh wow! So, uh, I hadn't seen it until we planned this. Been Don't meaning to second watch in. Yeah, so I watched watched it three times in the last few weeks. Hmm. Got those special features. <laughs> uh, you could probably easily find the uh, alternate ending. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, that one. Yeah, it's yeah. on yeah. iTunes. Yeah, uh, it's uh... well, I've rented, I've rented on Amazon, and I feel like I should have gotten the alternate ending. Um, Amazon is cheap, obviously. That's not cool. I'm disappointed. Bezos ripped you off, so he... They sure did. I mean, yeah, I'm going to blame him for everything. They they might have um been available through Vudu. Because I mean, I, I have a I mean, I own it on Blu-ray, but I also had the digital mm -hmm. version uh, the version of it through Vudu. And I went ahead and just put it on that way. And I pulled up the special features through that. That sucks. Because I could have. I could still access it through Voodoo. So I'm like, I wonder if I just rented it, I could have access to it. I thought I had that thought. Mm -hmm. If I did that for another movie that I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody tell us. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. I got all those special features when I bought it on iTunes. Well, now I know better. Now I know better. Lesson learned. Well, well, thank you again, Courtney, for, thank for you. coming. Thank you. Wonderful thank you. always to uh, to talk to you. But yeah, I know. I, I uh, the only people I had that I had talked about this with were people that are horror fans, but mm -hmm. that really just didn't want to delve into yeah. the meat of what was being discussed mm -hmm. yeah and what potential was being discussed yeah so and I, I was kind of like oh they're just I think there are things that yeah so thank you <laughs> thank you um this is a good conversation and like I said, I've, I've, I've had a couple of rants with people, but it's nice to have um, an exchange, an actual exchange. So thank, thank you both. Well, and Court, I think I also mentioned to you that I also have not seen many, uh, you know, Black voices, like mm -hmm. other than like Black podcasters mm -hmm. really talking about this outside of just oh the horror kind of aspect and then and and including someone who was a person of color in the conversation mm. you know i i just i mean darren do you i mean do you feel that you've heard well, any, been, on any podcasts i've been avoiding listening to people talk about it okay. because i wanted to go in uh untouched by i didn't i knew i wanted to watch it so i didn't even watch any of the trailers which you know i'm not a big anti-trailer person as some people tend to be in the fandom of movies but i knew i was gonna watch it so i was like i don't want to hear anybody else talk about it until i've seen it yeah, smart but move. i will look for that there have been some uh shows that i've purposefully skipped over because that was the conversation but i can without even looking i can guarantee you there are a lot of people that are outside of either the economic class or other things talking with false authority on the things in this movie mm -hmm. well, so it's, oh, it's, oh, it's, that it's a very oh my lopsided goodness. world of criticism. Oh my goodness! Speaking of, speaking of that, I did read one review of this that would kind of trashed it, and it was obviously written from a wealthy white person's mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm who was more involved in the art world and oh my goodness they were so tone deaf it was disgusting it was it, it i was just like oh my goodness <laughs> no i wanted that's to an art, yeah, that's an article i will not ask you to send my way no i did not share <laughs> that oh, yeah. with anybody i just like I, I was like if i had this in print right here you know, in like a newspaper or a magazine, I'd throw it across the room. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not surprising to hear, but, um, because there was no constructive criticism to it whatsoever. Yeah. Not yeah. interested. <laughs> the movie obviously wasn't for them. And, well, and that's fine. Playing but... 5.9 rating on, um, I, I think there was there was a a, a low five point something rating on Rotten Tomatoes too. Um, yeah, I think it's it's scored were rated pretty low across the board. Yeah, and I I understand not every movie is for every person. That's fine, but if your if your job is to be a critic. There should be a certain point where you can offer some objective criticism. 
Oh, okay. I thought they were in the art world and just uh, critiquing the, the film as someone in that industry. I, I might have. Well, missed. well, no, they're they're a critic, but they they mostly work like writing for like in the art industry. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But they also do some. But they also do film. Got it. Yeah. Not interested. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, oh, okay. yeah, not even worth. Yeah, honestly, for for me personally, um, I'm I'm not interested in in wasting my time or energy on articles mm -hmm. like that or perspectives that are just so closed minded and blind. Yeah, mm -mm. I'm good. Hey, and I, the only reason I even read it is because like I just. The headline was deceiving. <laughs> mm, well, yeah. Yeah. Hold you on in. Anyway. Yeah, well, that's why I, I try. I mean, honestly, I, I I know I don't read. I don't. I try to avoid a lot of trailers mm -hmm. ahead of time. And I, I don't want to be spoiled with most things ahead of time. At least I should say certain things I know I'm definitely going to see. You know, so I'm I'm similar. Okay, well, Courtney, I will let you go, and then Darren and I will wrap up the show. Okay. All right. Thank you both again. Uh, great meeting you, Darren. Vanessa, as always, great having these conversations with you. And um, y'all have a good night. You too. Thanks for your time. It was nice to meet you too. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay, Darren. All right. We're almost finished, but I figured I'd let Court go, <laughs> not bother her with our house cleaning. Oh, yeah. You never have your guests help with the cleaning after the party. They get to go home. No, but I'm the guest who always ends up like I offer to help just cause. Well, right. I mean, there's, there's always the offer and you just have yeah. to be ready to be taken up on that offer. So next month, it's that time of year, folks. It is March madness again. That's right. And what are we? Let me let me find what we are reading. Oh, I've got it right here if you don't have it. Okay. You want to pull that out before because I don't have it handy. Okay, yes. The book is Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s by Dan Pipenbring and Tom O'Neill. Yes. From uh, published 2019. So that was the book you picked. And it is paired with the movie. The movie, um, Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So About the same year as the book was published. Ah, yeah. So yeah, we're uh, we're kind of going uh, little Manson this time around into the family. Um, you know, and it, and it's interesting because Charles Manson and the Manson clan. Not my, f not my, f my favorite cult i'll tell you about and i will uh, i'll go more into that one uh next month but um these two selections are a little different discussions than uh yeah than you're used to having about charles manson and the family yeah uh, creative nonfiction. 
or fictionalized reality. A little bit of both. Or hidden oh, yeah. reality. You yes. decide. So. Tune yes. in next month. For another episode of March Madness. I don't know how basketball people talk. Yeah. I don't know. Ohio State and Indiana University had a game here yesterday or the day before. But anyway, that is basketball references. So, well, you watch basketball, but yes, I know. I, I save all mine for the March Madness episode. That's about. That's almost. All I know about this year's basketball is that a game happened here a couple days ago. And um, so, yeah, we will probably have a special guest as we usually do. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, so there will be that. And Vanessa, you were just on an episode of Scream Queens, I believe. I. I was where we discussed the moose head over the mantle. Um, yeah, we discussed that for Women in Horror Month. Um, that was fun. Um, yeah. And actually, I'm going to be on a March Madness episode for a different show, but it's not our kind of March Madness. It will be related to exploitation. So I will tell you more on that later. All right. As usual, uh, hit us up at VD Clinic Pod in most of the places that you would look for us on the internet. Oh, which, by the way, still still had the book giveaway. <laughs> Somebody mentioned it uh, in somewhere. Somebody but... mentioned it, but nobody sent in an email. Ah, uh, no email. Still a little bit of time? Well, I was going to say, I, I'd be willing to extend it another month till the end of March. You're just missing out on free shit, people. And that's yeah. good at mailing people things. Books. And so. if, I don't know, I might throw in a movie. She's sweetening the deal, everyone. Uh... The candy Vanessa. Okay. <laughs> the Van Vanandy woman is. See, now we, we let her go before the gibberish started. Uh but See? yes. Exactly. <laughs> this, the pot has been sweetened. Vanessa is climbing through a hole in the wall with a book and maybe even a movie. At VD Clinic Pod at G or VD Clinic Pod at Gmail dot com, at VD Clinic Pod and the other places. Right. This is me signing out so Vanessa can get the last word. Okay. Bye, everybody. Talk to you next month. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod, or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.